A um, couple of things that might be a help on Sunday mornings. Um, let's be sure to uh, talk to visitors, be good to people. Uh, Matthew 22, and um, there's visitors that come along, and um, you're here all the time. You don't even think about it, but people come walking in, and they don't know where to go and where to sit or what to do, and, and uh, good, good church etiquette. If somebody's sitting near you, um, open a hymnal to the right page and offer it to them. If, you don't, if they're not holding a Bible, and you and your spouse have a Bible, go to the right, go, go to the text and offer your Bible to them or sit by them uh, so they can read it. Um, you know, and they may have a phone out and you don't realize it. Uh, you know, they're looking at their phone and they know just what they're doing. They're saying, what's wrong with you using paper? I got digital, I got digitized Jesus here. Um, but uh, uh, and out in the parking lot and, you know, people are walking and not know where kids go and things. Uh, that's, that's on purpose. Um, once in a while, you'll, there'll be a, little guy or girl that's uh, can't find a parent uh, or a parent can't find a kid and uh, just you be the ambassadors on the property that'll be a, just be a good thing um, everybody matters everybody matters and that's a good thing so um, look there at Matthew 22 and if you're able to let's stand together and um, tonight I'm preaching on violating the great commandment violating the great commandment look at Matthew 22 and verse 34 Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, and by the way, he's going to put everybody to silence one day. Every mouth will be stopped. There's no one going to be explaining before him. There's no one, uh, when, when we face the Lord Jesus Christ, no one's going to be justifying their sin or explaining their lack of obedience. Um, you know, in the, the little discussion in the Garden of Eden, um, you know, well, it's the, it's the serpent beguiled me. And then, uh, you know, and the husband says, well, the woman thou gave us. I think, I think every mouth will be stopped and just in humble worship. And we'll realize he's right, we're wrong, and we owe him everything. And here's a little foretaste of that. Verse 35, then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said unto him, and I understand there's the Ten Commandments, and there's also several hundred more. Uh, Master, which is the great one, verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And let's pray. Help us tonight, Lord, and uh, we pray for instruction from your Holy Spirit and in each of our lives there are these areas where we violate uh, the great commandment and so help us uh, to be humble uh, people who love you and that our life's choices might be because we love you and we pray you speak to us and help us tonight in Jesus name amen you can be seated um, the as I spoke recently if you want to flip back a page or two in Matthew 10 uh, verse 37, Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he goes on, uh, if you don't hate your own, your own self, um, our love for God, you've heard the phrase, um, they passed me like I was standing still. And that's the, what he's talking about there in, in Matthew 10, 37. Our love for God ought to make our love for, for our fellow man like it's not there at all. It, it ought to be so great. And uh, a colloquialism of uh, when he said uh, that uh, you hate not to your father and mother, uh, we shouldn't love anybody more than the Lord. Um, there was a, a man, Edward Whiteman, in uh, 1612. Uh, he was famous because he was the last martyr burned at the stake in England. And uh, later, his great-grandson pastored an incredible church in America. And what a heritage to be able to stand in the pulpit. Yeah, my, my grandpa, he burned at the stake. And uh, I don't want my grandkids to say that. <laughs> Let your grandkids say that. But uh, Edward Whiteman was burned at the stake. And the, the basic, you know, the basic crime was like so many in that era. 
He said baby baptism is not in the Bible. And he said the Catholic Church is not right, you know, from the Pope to their edicts to the whole thing. We need to obey the Bible and not man. And, uh, and in those days, they'd put you in jail and they'd bribe you trying to get you to change. And they'd threaten you trying to get you to change. And then they'd put you on a rack trying to get you to change. A growth pro program, uh, very painful. And, uh, and then they'd kill you. That's the bottom line. And, um, and Edward Whiteman, uh, basically, he spoke against the Catholic Church and against infant baptism. They burned him at the stake. And, uh, and that was, again, 1612. This was being put together in 1611. So just because some people were trying to get some things going right doesn't mean there's not, not a problem. And, and uh, this is the era when Pilgrim's Progress was written. And um, there were many dissenters in jail simply for saying, no, we're not Catholics and we're not going to be a Catholic. And we don't believe that the Catholic priest can forgive sin. And we don't believe that bread is the flesh of Jesus. We don't believe that juice is the blood of Jesus. And we just flat don't believe it. It's all a lie. And then they'd throw him in jail and they'd kill him. And uh, some say as many as 50 million uh, Bible-believing people died throughout the Reformation and the Dark Ages. But, but the point in regard to our text in Matthew, when he said, what is the great commandment? And in Matthew 22, 37, he said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbors yourself. Those are the two great commandments, all of your Old Testament. You want to take this whole part of the Bible here, uh, Genesis to Malachi, you want to wrap it up in one simple uh, statement. It's love God and love your neighbor. All, the purpose for all the laws is a love for God and a love for our neighbor in the Ten Commandments. The first four laws of the first table, uh, those are all geared toward God. No other gods before me. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't have any idols, all that thing. Uh, that's, that's vertical commands. And then the other commandments are between us and our fellow man. No adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't covet, those kind of things. But you want to wrap that all up, all of the law and the prophets wrapped up in love your neighbor and love, uh, love God and then love your neighbor. And the idea of loving God with all of our heart is, uh, is simply, it's just, it really is by the wayside a lot, and it always has been. Look at Daniel, if you're uh, comfortable flipping around a little bit. Daniel chapter 3 in your Bible, a very familiar story. Daniel being thrown in the lion's den. But what I want you to notice is a little phrase that King Nebuchadnezzar made when Daniel was brought out of the lion's den. We understand um, they said, you pray to anybody but the king, make any petition to anyone but the king, uh, for the next 30 days, we'll throw you in jail. Daniel, as his manner was, opened his windows, prayed toward Jerusalem three times a day. They arrest him, and they take him, they throw him in the lion's den. Um, he takes, the, you know, takes a nap on lions. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to go to a lion's den, just sleep in there and walk out? It'd be so. The only problem is he didn't know he was going to get out. You know, us knowing the story, oh, yeah, I'd go with Daniel. That'd be awesome. Yeah, but he didn't know the end of the story. Like Stephen was stoned and killed. Uh, James was imprisoned and beheaded. And Peter was imprisoned and let go. God doesn't do the same thing for everybody, all right? And I think we understand that. But uh, when Daniel's there in the lion's den and he gets out, I want you to notice in Daniel chapter 3 and uh, look at verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake, I'm sorry, this is not Daniel in the lion's den. I was reading that story this afternoon. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were told to bow down to the statue. I got the wrong Bible story. And uh, they said they wouldn't bow down. He threw them in the fiery furnace. All right, that's where we're going. And my apologies, I've read too many stories this afternoon. I should just read my notes, but notes are a hindrance to a good preacher. Um, so uh, Daniel, or Na Daniel, he knows where Daniel is. He's not even in the story. Uh, this is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You know that, right? Um, so they don't get burned in the fiery furnace. They come out of the fiery furnace. In verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word. That means the king said, I'm going to burn you. And the king of kings said, no, you're not. 
These men's faith changed the king's word. But I want you to notice this next little phrase, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. They yielded their bodies. They said, there's a God who gave us some commandments, and there's our body, and we would rather our body be burnt than disobey the command of God. Now, we all know that story. Kids, a kid's story. All the kids know it. But just sit and think through. And, and again, everybody's got to make their decisions and all these things, but I think how many, how many Christians have failed to read their Bible, but they buy organic bread? I'm not asking you to raise your hands. Uh, how, how, many, how many Christians um, haven't read their Bible in weeks? Not you, of course. It's the people out there. Uh, haven't picked up a Bible to read it in weeks, but they go to the gym to keep the, I'm keeping the temple healthy. You know that temple healthy thing? That's really not very much in the Bible. You'll find a lot more people that are burnt and fed to lions and crucified and all kinds of things. God wants your heart. And uh, in the story here with, with, da with Daniel's friends, they just said, no, burn us. I don't care. We're not going to do it. Edward Whiteman, the last man burned at the stake. I just pulled a couple of stories from, uh, maybe you've read some, you've seen a great big old book called Martyr's Mirror, and all the way up through the 1700s, stories of, of God's people, uh, tortured, burned at the stake, very touching, and they document it with meticulous detail. Um, 1410, a uh, tradesman was condemned as a heretic uh, by the Roman bishops. He was delivered to a secular judge because he believed and said the bread in the Lord's Supper uh, was given for a memorial. He denied sub transubstantiation. That means that's the Catholic doctrine that the bread, when the priest prays over it, becomes the literal flesh of Jesus. And he said, no, it doesn't. It's bread, as any intelligent person knows. Um, it's not possible. And for this, he had to suffer the slow and dreadful death by fire. Um, a couple of years later, 1417, on the second day of October, two in the afternoon in Montpelier, France, um, a man was sentenced to death and pronounced to execution. Oh, lady, I'm sorry, in this case, a God-fearing woman uh, in Lorraine. Her name was Catherine Saab, who, loving her Savior more than her own life, steadfastly fought through death, pressing her way through the straight gate into the spacious mansions of heaven, left flesh and blood on a post in the burning flames on the place of execution. What a writing. Who writes like that? We just said, oh, they tortured her and she died. No, she, she pressed her way through the straight gate into the spacious mansions of heaven and left her flesh and blood on the post in the burning flames in the place of execution. This was written in the 1600s as they gathered these stories and they wrote about these people as heroes. People who said that is real Christianity. People who, and again, we, we have a problem. We've been so blessed with freedom and we've been blessed with lots of churches. But understand, the freedom we enjoy has been very new to the world, less than 200 years. And uh, you go back to the 1600s, 1700s, an awful lot of religious persecution of Bible believers in the eastern states. And, and it can be gone as quickly as you have to put a mask on. 1421, just a couple of more years later, I just grabbed three examples this afternoon. Now when the children of light who confessed the doctrine of the Waldenses, that was a group of people, basically Baptists, they believe salvation by grace, you don't follow the, the, uh, the Pope or the priest, you follow the Bible, uh, they believe the salvation and baptism by immersion followed salvation, that the Bible's the word of God, the church is an independent body of saved, baptized believers, just, they just believe what you and I believe. Um, in the midst of the darkness of popery, isn't that a great word? Uh, in the midst of the darkness of popery, began to lift up their hands more and more in the Flemish countries and to combat with the power of the word of God, the errors of the Roman church and to re reject principally papal authority, the mass, 
transubstantiation, pilgrimages, the invocation of saints, purgatory, infant baptism, swearing of oaths, revenge towards enemies. It's got this long list. No, we don't believe that. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. And they were lifting up their hands. The whole countryside heard about these Waldenses. And um, on account of this, um, uh, the prince of the king of darkness, through the instrumentality of the satellites, laid his hands on them and ultimately brought the matter so far uh, that they uh, in no wise, neither for life nor death, would apostatize. They wouldn't turn from their statements. They were condemned to be burned alive, um, which was also done to them in the year 1421. And here's this final statement. Wherefore, the captain of the faith, Jesus Christ, shall hereafter eternally crown them as pious champions with the unfading crown of honor, according to his promise, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That was the spirit of these people. This is a, a Dutch person who put these stories together. Their spirit was a one of majesty and honor and respect and dignity. And when someone was willing to say, I will burn before I'll disobey my Bible, they just said, yeah, you know, it's like your team getting the winning score at the buzzer or whatever. And, and uh, they're cheering on. It's like, I think the 1600 pages in this book of story after story of these people who said, no way do we bow. We have a faith and we believe in some things. Uh, the followers of Wycliffe said, um, the sacred, uh, they, they deny the, the sacrament of the altar uh, after the priest has read the canon, still remains bread. Boy, were they in trouble for that. Uh, that the image, that images are not to be worshipped. I don't know where I mentioned this the other day, but my wife and I were talking about the, um, uh, the Ten Commandments. She'd been teaching on that in her adult ladies' class. And the one taking the Lord's name in vain, we are talking about what that meant. And, uh, you know, we refer to it often in our culture of, of using Jesus' name in a curse way or whatever, and probably not what was meant on the mount of uh, uh, on the Mount Sinai, we got talking about it. So we, we talked, looked at Bible verses, and we, we looked in the, in the internet and looked at that, um, the, the Ten Commandments, and trying to figure out what they were. And it's interesting that the, the Catholic, one Catholic website we went on, they pulled out not bow down before any statues. And they took another of the commandments and split it into two, so there's still ten. I thought... Can you believe it? I mean, that, who would have the audacity to take parts of the Bible out? New American Standard, Revised Standard, Living Bible, Good News for Modern Man. I mean, people do it all the time. Anyway, let's don't be real hard on these Catholics. Um, pil that's a commercial break. Pilgrimages ought not to be made that the priest has no right to appropriate any title to themselves. And men ought not to swear. And they mean swear like oaths and pledges and things. You see, you know, you know where we are in America? The, the great commandment is to love God with all your heart. And the second, to love your neighbor. You know, we love sports. We love sports. We just do. Now, I'm going to step on some sacred cows tonight, so please prepare for hamburger. Uh, moo. <laughs> That could be the other side of an amen when we hit your sacred cow. We have the moo in church. We love sports, and there's things we will do for sports that we would not do in any other way. Places we would not go, but we will for sports. People we would not go with, but we will for sports. You know what? Something is juggling our faith. Something is adjusting our love, making decisions. You know what else we love? We love security. Moo, there's a sacred cow. Now, I'm not against planning, and I'm not against preparing and all that kind of thing, but I'll tell you what, we make an awful lot of decisions on the basis of what is secure. And no offense, but ladies, you're worse at this. We, uh, you know, the... Well, I'm going to live by faith. But if I don't have the money in the bank and I can't see the way to do it, I'm not going to do it. Well, what is there faith or not? 
And we need to ask ourselves, is security, you know, so, it's so funny. I remember many years ago, might be a couple of guys in here that are married, we're there, but I was having lunch with some of our college guys, and we're sitting around a table at some famous place like Culver's or Golden Corral, and uh, the guy said, hey, preacher, how much money did you have saved when you, get, you got married? Like $10,000 or $20,000? I said, like $10 or $20? I said, what do you mean $10,000? At this point in my life, when they were asking me, I'd never had $10,000 ever in my life, Amen. let alone saved it. I said, you guys... I was barely paying my school bill. And when we got married, my father and mother-in-law, and this has been 40 years ago, so I asked my wife if you want this, the real facts, but ballparking, they wrote a check to her for her wedding, $3,000, $4,000, whatever it was, and said, whatever you don't spend on the wedding, you and Bruce can keep for a honeymoon. That was our honeymoon money. We're the cheapest wedding ever, man. <laughs> wedding that lasts an hour, a honeymoon that lasts for days. That's called good investment. We, we got married on Saturday and uh, stayed in the area on Saturday night. We went to church on Sunday and drove over to the, the coast in the humble area Sunday afternoon, had a church picked out to go to Sunday night, and the dumb church didn't have Sunday night service. So we, we sat in the motel room and played a cassette tape of a sermon of our pastor, Dr. Hiles, and, and uh, spent Monday hanging out, doing nothing, just wandering together. When you can be alone in a car in a room, walking the hills. To, with, with, man, that was awesome. You don't need, who wants to go to Disneyland where there's a bunch of people when you can be alone for the first time? And um, we wandered around Tuesday and just hung out together. And, and uh, Wednesday we drove back, got our stuff, and started driving back to Indiana. The rest of our honeymoon was driving uh, 22,000 miles or whatever to finish up college. How much money we had saved? I don't know, $20, $30? Uh, my, you know, you guys, and again, I'm, I'm not against, I, if you are making good money, you should use it for God and save some and all that. But I, you know, I had married friends who were making three and a quarter an hour. I had a good job. I was making $12 an hour, but I only worked 28 hours a week. And, um, but we got time for a wedding ring. I didn't have the money to buy a ring. I went to God in prayer. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. And an elderly lady I'd led to Christ. She was probably 50, this old lady. And, um. <laughs> But when you're, when you're 22, 50's really over the hill. I mean, she had one foot in the grave and one in the banana peel. And, and I go by on Saturday visiting her. She rode my bus. This is a bus rider from Chicago. And um, I'd, I'd always go in her house because when we'd be there, she always had on the coffee table, she had snacks, crackers and whatever. And, and uh, when, you know, we didn't have any extra food in those days. And and uh, I'd been praying for a ring. I wanted to ask my wife to marry me. And I wasn't about to ask her to help me save money to buy her ring. What kind of manliness is that? And if you did that, I'm sorry for the kind of man you girls married. But <laughs> whatever. You know, whatever works. There's no right or wrong. I just felt like I wanted to put a ring on my wife's finger that I got. And she said, I was thinking about you this week. And she, you know, slowly worked her way up the stairs and came back down and said, I was thinking about you this week. I started cleaning out a drawer and I found this, and she handed me a box, and it was her wedding and engagement ring that was all worn out, and next to it was a brand new wedding and engagement ring, never worn. And back 1934 or whatever, she'd gotten engaged, took the ring, went home, told her dad, he said, you're not marrying that guy, and she kept the ring. <laughs> God had her keep the ring for me. Clear back in 1934, whatever year it was, all the way up to 1979, God had a plan for my ring, for my prayer. I hadn't even been born. My mom had not been born. Never mind, I'm not going to ask when you were born. Uh, but it was back there. But, you know, there's a God in heaven, and we are so passionate. And again, I'm not against Dave Ramsey and being careful with your money and all this, but look, folks, you're going to pack up and go to the mission field. You better go with Jesus. Because there's no security. Brother Wilder, that uh, in whatever country he's in, uh, I said it wrong, and he's on Honduras, Guatemala, Tijuana, I don't know. He's in Guatemala. Um, I pray for them. I don't pray for their country. 
when he and his family were in the States oh, last year during COVID, they were get, they'd gotten everything cleared to go back to, uh, you know where. And uh, they just had to get a negative test. So they're all in Florida. They all get tested, you know, five kids and mom and dad. And everybody tested negative except dad. He tested positive for COVID. And what I was shocked, because these tests are not always accurate. And uh, he put his wife and kids in the plane and sent them to Guatemala. And he, he, he sent a text or an email, whatever I got. And he said, well, I'm like a homeless person. I'm wheeling my suitcase around Florida with no place to go. And uh, I got a hold of him and said, you need money? Oh, we'll, we'll rent you a motel for a few days. He said, no, I got money. He said, I'm just teasing. But got another test the next day, negative, got on a plane. You know, you just do what you have to do. This idea that everything's got to be exactly in order and exactly in place, that's good for bookkeepers, mechanics, maybe people who write computer programs. <clears throat> do we love God more than we love security? What about our children? Do we want our kids to love God? Or do we want our kids to be successful in the eyes of the world? Do we want to be able to go to our neighbor and say, oh, yeah, my son, he's at Harvard? If a Christian came to me and said that, I'd say, I am so sorry. Is there any way we could pray them out? And it might, I'm not saying it's not God's will. I'm just saying it's probably not. But it could be. I don't know. Who knows what God's got a plan? They might bring revival to Harvard. I have no idea. But we are, we are we, with our children, is our ultimate goal. See, the great commandment is to love God, not to make money. The great commandment is to love God, not to be a great athlete. The great commandment is that my children would grow up and love God and love his book. And whether they're garbage collectors or missionaries doesn't matter. What matters is do they love God? I talked to a preacher one day. We talked. He said, you know what? Just be candid. I've not read my Bible in a year. His church probably run, I don't know, 1,500. Of course, his life ended in a shipwreck too. But with my children, with your children, ask yourself, when we start talking about the great, the, the, the lawyer said, Lord, what is the great command or master? What's the great command? Love God. Well, if that's the great commandment, then you, 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 know, you want your kids to be on drugs? Oh, no, it'd be terrible. My kids are on drugs. It'd be worse your kids didn't love God. Isn't that right? If the great commandment is to love God, then the great sin is to not love God. And we're panicked that our kid would be a drug addict because it would look bad to our friends. Or it would be bad for their finances. And I'm not saying I want my kids on drugs. But I really want my kids to love God. How about why we pick our church? Have you ever, have you ever noticed politicians rarely visit fundamental, soul-winning, separated churches? Now, they might show up for a service. I'll invite them, and they'll come here, and they're good people. But where are they a member? They're a member of the Blur Church. Say, so what's Blur? All the lines are blurred. Because they don't want to, look, a politicians, they need votes. They can't afford to offend anybody. Uh, I, I heard, I heard um, one of the biggest named preachers in America. I know he's not a preacher. He's a reverend. I don't know what he is. Someone said, they were interviewing him, and, and they said, and I heard it out of his own mouth. They said, now, what about the homosexual issue? What about you and the Bible and the homosexual issue? And he says, oh, whatever the guy's name was, Bill or whatever. Let's don't go there. Blur church. Blur church. You know what? I'm against liquor. I'm against gambling. And I think uh, adultery is wrong. Drunkenness is wrong. Um, any kind of inappropriate behavior between men and women. I don't think men and men is a right thing. It's uh, called sodomy in the Bible. Uh, look, that's, those are Bible terms. Don't be embarrassed of the word of God. Uh, I don't like the world's music in God's house. And I think there's one Bible, it's the Word of God. I don't think any other book calling itself a Bible is the Word of God. And I'm not mad at anybody else, and I'm not mad at anybody. I go down to the bar, and I'm not mad at the bartender or the people at the bar that drink the liquor. They just need Jesus. But it's going to be obvious. Someone, someone said from a, a, a different denomination, I don't know, denomination not a good term, but a different type of church than ours. We were talking one day, and he said, well, one thing about you, he said, everybody knows where the lines are drawn. 
And I said, well, thank you. He said, yeah, he said, 40 years, who could do what you've done and kept the lines so clear? And he, he meant it as a compliment. He's very gracious about it. But why do we pick our church? Well, I just really like the music program. All right, show me the Bible verse that says you pick your church on the basis of the music program. Now, I like good music. Um, if I could just pick it out, I'd call on some of you like Josh and Esther Herb. You two get the fiddle and a bluegrass banjo going, and we want Latin bluegrass going up here, okay? I like bluegrass music, and uh, I, I like what we had tonight. I like all, I love good music. But I don't know anywhere in the New Testament you find them, all right, now the first thing we're going to do when we start our church is we're going to make sure our music program's good. No, it was preaching and soul winning and baptizing converts, teaching the word of God. Why do we pick our church? I mean, you pick this church, you're here on a Sunday night after a Christmas message on hell this morning. <laughs> And it really wasn't a message on hell. It was a message that God wants to deliver you from this present evil world. But hell got in there at the beginning. Why do we pick? You know, I, I have our kids there because they have such a great social program. You know, the ladies get together during the week and they're special. You'll have a hard time finding any special program. I'm for programs. We've got Baptist boys and blue denim and lace and we've got Christian school. You know what your New Testament is? Soul winning and preaching holiness and suffering let's get those things right and if we don't have those things right none of the rest of it matters and see loving God is loving his book and so we need to keep in mind do we love God and why do we pick the church we pick well I pick the church I pick because I love this book and I love the God of this book and I want everything in here and then you know I could go to the south and join a church that has a uh, one of my good friends in North Carolina he's got a a, a stamps baxter inspirations type church i could go there i would not have a problem with that at all uh that's just not but yeah i don't look i'm not worried about that i am concerned when nobody's getting saved i am concerned when there's no new faces and and uh you know if nobody's out having a cigarette between sunday school and church it, it's a de it, not deacons okay but i want new converts you know i i, I want people that are still struggling we want new people to get saved and coming into church and and i like that i look out and i think man what's their name and, and who is that and i know who they are their face but i don't know them see the early church you know what the early church did the early church trained children to die you read the testimonies from the first thousand years of the church and the families, before TV and before social media, you know what they'd do? They'd sit around, and you can read this in that book, Martyr's Mirror. They'd sit around the fireplace, and they'd practice their testimony of what they would say as they were burned at the stake. Children. Many a 12, 13, 14-year-old child had screws driven into their shins trying to get the kids to deny their faith. And mom and dad had sat around the fire with the kids and mom shared their testimony and one of the saddest things that could happen to the Christians during the Reformation and the Dark Ages was when they cut their tongue out because they wouldn't be able to preach as they were burning. It just killed them. Or they'd stuff rags in their mouth so they couldn't, they couldn't share their testimony. These are great Christians. You know, a, a guy who runs the most yards in football and then and then looks up to heaven and says praise the lord i'm good with that but that's not a hero how would he do if they started putting nails through his hands to deny his faith see loving think about this thing we the <clears throat> violating the great commandment is when we love what men think of us more than we love what god thinks of us that early church was so different. Where we send our kids to school. Oh, your kids are going to a, an unaccredited school? Oh, I can't do that. I've got to make sure my kids are in an accredited school. Who accredits that school? And why do you care? You know, it's like the Little League accrediting the, the, the uh, national baseball teams you know the people who are going around wanting to accredit our christian schools or our christian colleges 
Who is it? Who is it that puts this little accredited note on there? <laughs> Pelosi. <laughs> you know, I send my, we send our kids to that school. They have such a good drama department. Oh, we have a junior high department too. <clears throat> We send our kids to this high school or this college because of their excellent academics. Oh, we've been working on that for years. We want our kids to know the Bible. This is the academics. You know, it's a sad thing to me that children in church don't know their Bibles. And our kids, and I've heard over and over and over for the last 30 years, I've heard college presidents, college staff from around the country, different colleges say, the young people from Faith Baptist Church, number one, they know how to work with people. They know bus routes, Sunday schools, and soul winning. And then number two, they know their Bible. I couldn't even begin to tell you the number of people who've said that to me. And I said, we got a, we got a great Sunday school department and we got a great staff. Why do we send our kids? What, why do we pick the school? Do we, here's a school, there's a school, there's a school. I mean, high school or college, it doesn't matter. Do we pick that school because we love God? Or do we pick that school because we love the money our children are likely to make? That's violating the great commandment. If, if putting my kids here makes more, gives them more prestige or more money, but doesn't, it's not because I love God, it's because I hope my kids will get rich and support me. And by the way, I hope they do. <laughs> but I'm not going to pick the school on the basis of that. You see, self-denial is really the problem in our world. Self, it's, it's self-denial to put your kids in a, in a school that your family members are going to say, oh, really? You know, one of our ladies years ago, her dad was a doctor, an unsaved doctor, and, and she got so much flack for having her kids in our school. But you know, it's funny, when the kids grow up and turn out, nobody's teasing anymore. Because when there's hurt and suffering and anger and broken hearts and broken homes and drugs and all these things it doesn't matter what the career is it matters that matters the home self-denial see the the world would rather the church you go to make you look good than the church you go to get people into heaven there's there's churches all over this community they never pass out a gospel track and uh, and I, 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 I on purpose don't know what churches do because I don't want to become a critic. I drive by the local churches and I pray for them. And I'm assuming they're all preaching the gospel. But when we knock on doors and people have been going to this church for whatever church it is for years, you know, I've been going to that church for about 10 years. Let me ask you, uh, is that where you got saved? Is that where you trusted Christ? Well, you know, I'm really trying. After 10 years in a church, you're still trying to get saved. You're obviously, you need to try something else. You need, to, you need to try to find someone that can tell you how to get saved. But are we, are we picking churches? Are we picking schools? And this, the worldly church would rather let people die and go to hell because it's very self-denying to do this. Hi, I'm in the neighborhood from Faith Baptist Church, and somewhere in my pocket I've got a gospel track I'd like to leave with you. That's not easy. That's not easy at all. Uh, you see... Uh, preaching on sin is hard. Bringing your sophisticated friend to a church that preaches on sin, that's even harder. It's one thing, you young men that might preach one day, it's one thing for you to stand up here and preach holiness and righteousness, but don't you forget, your church members are bringing their friends in. Brother Steve, remember when you brought all those Indian, that Indian family from your bus route? Never forget, he'd been working with his family. Indian gaming was on the ballot. And there were signs all over, legalize Indian gaming. And, and I don't know if I'd ever talked about it before or after. But that week, Steve had a family, Indian family. He'd gotten into church, and they were here for the very first time. And I didn't know who they were. I just said, you know what? If the Indians need a job, they can get, they need money, they can get a job like anybody else can. And they had this big banner in their front yard, legalized Indian gaming, of all Sundays. It's like you bring your Catholic friend, and I preach the no hope in the Pope or something like that. But 
It is awkward being, you know, a church that doesn't cater to your social relationships. That's hard. But a church that caters to his relationship is the big deal. You see these people we read about earlier? Their social relationships were not helped by their church. They died because of their church. You won't stay long, not you, but people won't stay long in a church that's focused on souls rather than a warm and fuzzy atmosphere. Uh, the big, a big movement always coming and going in Christianity has been Calvinism, that God predestines. And, and here's the idea that uh, he's predestined to heaven, he's predestined to hell, he's predestined to heaven. Aren't you glad you sat there? And uh, that's what they believe. That's when they talk about Calvinist doctrines, one of the doctrines of Calvinism, that God foreordains things. And, and, you know, that is such a great thing if you don't want to be a soul winner. There's no point in me going soul winning because it's all ordained. But you know what's really funny? You get to those people and you say, all right, let's go to the church nursery. <clears throat> let's look at six babies there. Which one's foreordained for hell? And you know what they'll say? Oh, none of them. God wouldn't ordain a baby to hell. But he has no problem saying God would ordain you to hell. And you know why? Because their religion is based on feeling and not fact. And, and then if you really start pinning them down, they'll say, well, there's a point when God ordains them to heaven or hell. Which is really interesting because their text verse is that you were ordained before the foundation of the world. Man, those guys, you know what? When you start getting away from the Bible, you really become a mess. But the reason Calvinistic churches are so, they're so popular because you go to Bible studies, you fill your mind with Bible facts, and you feel like you're a good Christian, and you never have to be awkward hearing a sermon against liquor or having a sermon on bus ministry and soul winning or why are we not at the rescue mission or why are we not out having big days in the neighborhoods because, tell you what, to go out in the neighborhood and have big days and give away turkeys and preach the gospel to people that are, that are rough, that's hard. But where did Jesus preach? You know, to hang around a church where the pastor talks about modest apparel, that is really self-denial. <laughs> you know, when, um, are, you, are you more concerned about how God sees your dress are you more concerned about what your social client, your, your peers think? See, violating the great commandment is when we love our own reputation more than we love the honor of God. And the things that make old-fashioned churches unpopular is one word, self-denial. Uh, the, average, the average person who does not like a church like ours, that's, 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 I'm talking about Christians, they're not bad people. They just don't like coming to church feeling uncomfortable. They don't like going into their closet feeling guilty about certain clothing. They don't like watching TV and feeling guilty about certain things they're watching. They don't like going to the bar with their friends after work and feeling guilty they're at the bar. And they, you know what happens? They're at the bar feeling guilty, and they say, I hate that church. Well, do you love God more or your friends at the bar? And a lot of the vicious uh, feelings among, look, I don't have a problem towards any, you know, cornerstone, whatever, rock and roll, twig, vine, branch, chapel. I don't have a problem. That's their church, whatever they want to be. The blur, they could call it blur churches. We don't know what we believe. Tell you one thing that's awkward is when you say we go to a Baptist church. That's very awkward. Because you know what? Typically, not much anymore, but typically Baptists believe something. It's way better to be in the chapel or the Bible church or we're in the community fellowship or the church of the, uh, of the North Star. You know why? Because you don't have to believe anything. You don't have to look a certain way, act a certain way. Uh, you, can, you can keep this blur so we're all warm and fuzzy. Jesus said you're a bunch of whited sepulchers. John the Baptist said you're a generation of vipers. Very unpopular. Almost every church today has got this um, indistinct line. You know what's funny, you young people? Any idea what kind of phone I have? I have an Apple phone. Right, Benny? And you know what you might ask? Which one? 
and I'll say, the one that works. Which phone do you have? I don't know. And I'll hand it to them. Let them figure out what phone it is. It doesn't matter what phone I have. It matters, does it work when I push the little buttons? No, forget that. When I say, call Tammy Goddard, it rings her phone. That's all that... I've got to stop it. <laughs> I'll get the iPhone 12. And? You know, you've you got $900 shoes? Really? I'm sorry. Were you drunk? <laughs> you know, this purse, this is a Gucci or couch or coach. <laughs> you know what it is? It's a bag you hang on your arm to hold your stuff. Now, I don't care if you've got a $700 bag on your shoulder. But I'd rather give you a $50 bag and give $650 to Nate Beal down in Chile, right, Nate? Absolutely. And let him buy his wife a, a couch purse. <laughs> you know, this, see, a church that expects people to live something, it's very hard on self. See, the goal is who do we love? Charles Spurgeon, late 1800s. Charles Spurgeon got saved early, and, and at night, by the time he was 19, he had the largest church in London, built a huge church. He could fill a 5,000-seat auditorium as many times on Sunday as he wanted. He might, on some, time, some days he would say, all right, the evening service, no church members can come. We want only lost people, and he'd fill the building with lost people without the Internet, just word of mouth. Thousands of people would come, thousands and thousands. He started a college, and he personally trained these young men. He was a soul-winning Baptist, and he believed in holiness. He wrote, I am bothered by the compromise among preachers who are going to the theater. What's the theater like in 1880? I'm looking for somebody that you would know back that far. but He was... Man, Spurgeon was hard. And you know what happened? Charles Spurgeon, there was, a, there, were a, there was a thousand Baptists involved in the London Baptist Association. Can you imagine a thousand Baptists in the area around London? I can't even fathom that. There's probably not 10 today. I don't know that. But. And so they had this kind of a little association of these Baptists. And uh, he urged to have a statement of faith. He said, we need a statement of faith that says what we believe, and, and they, somebody wrote it, and it was this gushy, you know, you have to love God and love the Bible kind of a statement of faith. And he said, no, no, no. And he wrote, he wrote a, a thing called The Sword and the Trowel. It was a very, very huge publication in, in England, all over England. And um, he called it the downgrade controversy. And it was all about Baptists. He said, the Baptists are getting downgraded, compromising in their lifestyle, drinking liquor, going to the theater, compromising their personal holiness. It's a big deal. A thousand preachers get together, and Charles Spurgeon introduces a conservative, straight, separated statement of faith. 950 voted against it. And the guy who wrote it at the biggest church in all of England. His wife said, and many of those people that voted against it were his own students. People he'd trained, people he'd put in the ministry, help build their churches. But his stand for holiness and his stand saying we are going to love God and we are to be denying ourselves. By the way, nobody knows the name of the people who voted against it, but they all know the name of the guy who wrote it. Deep intellectual people with no lifestyle honoring God? How do we handle our money? How do we handle our personal relationships? And, and the, the vehemence, the passionate attack that you might face during the holidays, it just might be something as simple as, yeah, I read a King James Bible. Now, you know what? I, other than here in our church, I'll mention it here. If I'm at a relative's house and they've got an NIV or an RSV or an M-I-C-K-E-Y, whatever, I don't say a word. It's none of my business what they read. I don't mind. I'm glad they got a Bible or whatever you want to call it. 
I'll tell you, when you say you read a King James, why do you read that one? Well, why do you read the one you read? What are you so mad at me about? But it's because they know we believe something. I, for one, am weary of Christianity that makes every decision on the basis of how much money we have, how popular we are, or how comfortable it will make me. You're not supposed to make decisions on comfort or on money or on popularity. Our Savior did not take the comfortable route. He did not take the popular route nor the financially lucrative route. He took the route that loved God. And I hope we would always be that way. Let's pray. Help us, Father. We ask your blessing on us. And uh, even in the holiday season, we will be drawn and tempted and pulled away. And, and this is a world of compromise. And it's not new uh, with Spurgeon's struggle with the ba London Baptist Association. Uh, clear back in the late 1800s, uh, there were over 100 years ago the same compromise being pushed and we're going to face it. Our young people here are going to face it. Help us, Lord, to not be so focused on how many likes and followers we have, but on the one in heaven liking us and us following him. And so we'll protect our homes, protect our money, our values, our philosophies. And may we choose to follow you and to love you and to love our neighbor. And uh, we ask for help that this world wouldn't be the thing that moves us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for a moment of invitation. We're not going to have missionaries going around.